Episode 13, Three Point Sermon. Point one, America's Original Sin. But I think that we talk about, you know, wealth and power and sort of this, this um, like, consumption-oriented value system being an original sin and an original idolatry of America. I mean, that absolutely includes slavery in which like all of the like uh, productive engine of the country for 400 plus years was on the backs of people that were not um, given a choice about their labor and were exploited, exploited because of their race uh, exploited because of their, you know, their place in society, uh, generational sin upon generational sin, and, and violence on top of violence on top of violence. And then that just perpetuated itself after slavery ended into the Jim Crow era and segregation and continues to this very day as black men and women have to fear for their lives um, when they encounter police officers on a routine basis. Um, and, 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 and so I say all that to say, like, there is, even in the Black Lives Matter um, movement over the past uh, few months, there is, even in that, I think a fear, particularly on the part of, you know, relatively wealthy white suburban folk, uh, that if Black Lives Matter, then we're all in trouble because we can't possibly have a society where, where indeed all of these lives are equally important because they're lives, not because of what they produce or consume. And so I think even underneath that, that Black Lives Matter protest, there's a deeper layer of idolatry that needs to be excavated. And we saw it, frankly, uh, in the way that um, uh, certain factions of Christianity responded to uh, Trump's absolutely blasphemous use of the scriptures um, by gassing that plaza full of peaceful protesters, gassing the clergy at uh, St. John Episcopal Church, um, and then walking over there to hold a Bible, you know, up. Uh, it, it was absolute blasphemy and idolatry. Um, and all of it was, was in some ways um, propped up by a Christian church that is so enslaved to the idolatry of nationalism, nativism, and racism uh, that it can't, it can't possibly make a statement against it. And, and that is connected to wealth and privilege and power. Those are all intertwined. Yeah, so I've been, you know, talking about Black Lives Matter, talking about um, with folks that are just so polarized by what's going on right now, really trying to figure out why they are so infatuated with certain political leaders um, and, and folks that, you know, I, I respected. And now I'm thinking, why, why do you think you can you explain to me why this is? And the only thing that I've been the common thread that I can find is fear of their life changing in a way that they don't want. Whether that's immigration, um, whether it's talking about racial injustice, uh, whether it's talking about political parties, there's this fear that the life that they are comfortable living is somehow going to change for the worse if other people's lives change for the better. There's a threat. Mm -hmm. Point two. The heresy of rugged individualism. I think it's really funny you bring up that idea about like you know, not relating to your brother or sister, and that uh, there's there was a um, declared heresy from the Catholic Church in the early or late 19th century called Americanism, and one thing it really focused on was this idea of like rugged individualism. This thing you know, like you don't have any connection to your outside community, but it's only you and yourself type thing. And that's what matters. And that's what they described as Americanism. There was obviously some other stuff in there, like that was right after the French revolution and some other stuff that, you know, obviously had some other connotations rather than just that. But that was one of the, the big things that you could pick out this idea that, you know, like I'm responsible to me and nobody else, but that's not really how Christians view the world. We view that we have a responsibility to other people around us and that like, you know, and we should understand the experiences that those around us are, have gone through, even if we ourselves have not. And I, I, I like that idea a lot. You know, that's, that's, I think that's a very specific American thing that maybe sticks out more in their area rather than, 
you know, some other country that might not have that same type of viewpoint on how we relate to everybody else in our country, you know. Well, this goes to the idea of that Justin was, or I'm sorry, that Stacy <laughs> was was bringing up um, oh. about um, particularly impoverished white folk saying, uh, you know, I have problems too. And, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not any better off than, than the people that are, you know, protesting, you know, for Black Lives Matter. Um, I totally get that. But I think, I think there's a theologian. Um, I love that declared, the Declaration of Americanism is a heresy, because that's absolutely right. It can't be more antithetical to the gospel than to say it's all about me, right? The gospel says, love your neighbor as yourself, the end. There's no asterisk on that. Like, it's, that's it. That's the mandate. Um, but there's a theologian, a more recent theologian, he just died here in the last couple of years, named James Cohn. Um, black, black liberation theologian, a uh, brilliant man. I, I'm, a, I'm sort of a, a, a fan, a fanboy, James Cohn. I did a lot of research on him and, um, and wrote, a, wrote a thesis on James Cohn. And um, one of the things that he points out, I think very, very poignantly, and, it's, and it's, I think it's really, really important to keep that in mind as we talk about um, collectivism versus individualism in this sort of American context is that James James Cohn was was very very clear that my liberation is absolutely tied to your liberation, which is to say, until we are all free, none of us are truly free. And so so it, it, that that idea right there immediately puts into sharp relief the lie of Americanism, which is I can get everything I need for myself on my own. I don't need anyone or anything else. As long as I'm okay, I'm okay. And what, what liberation theology, what James Cohn uh, points out, is that the liberation of the black life is the only way for the white life to experience liberation. So, so blackness must be liberated. Uh, whiteness cannot be liberated if, if black people continue to be oppressed. Um, and, and that idea of whiteness, I think, is not just talking about the color of our skin, but it's an attitude and a philosophy and frankly, an idolatry. And that idolatry is this, that as long as I have power and privilege enough to provide for myself and my family, then there is nothing else that I need to worry about. Like that's whiteness in a nutshell. And, and, what, and what the Black Lives Matter movement is asking us to contemplate is the reality that that system is unsustainable. Like that system, of whiteness, if I can continue to use that word for a moment, is um, responsible for the oppression of black lives and other people of color. That whiteness is responsible for the destruction of the environment that's threatening uh, the global health and well being of every person on the planet. Um, th this idea that it's only about me and what I can get and how much I can take care of myself, that is the idolatrous attitude that is pushing us as a species, frankly, toward that Romans chapter one reality where idolatry is completely in control and you know, our, our very consciousness is warped. And we saw it really coming, I think, to full fruition in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Watching the way people, watch the way people behave when you ask them to put a mask on their face. Like there is nothing more idolatrous than the way people have responded to that simple request for the sake of the health of your health and the health of others. Can you wear this covering on your face? Yeah, it, it's like the ever long uh, debate between liberty and responsibility to those around you type thing. And I, I like while there might be some questions I may have against liberation theology in particular, I do think like what you're bringing up right, has a really good point in relation to like Matthew 20 when Jesus is talking about the parable with the vineyard workers talking about like, you know, somebody gets paid the same amount for one hour of work versus two hours of work versus, you know, like 30 minutes of work type thing. Like everybody looks at it as, you know, the, the master's being unfair, but Jesus's point is like, am I not allowed to be generous to those who, you know, I want to be generous to. And I, I think that's a, a passage that a lot of people miss and that like we view it as unfair but jesus's point is like you know i'm being generous to somebody i'm not trying to i'm not being unfair i'm being generous to some somebody else and we shouldn't be jealous over something like that point three has the bible become an idol uh, the one thing that i was wanting to bring up uh in terms of idols um and this is uh, this is from a, a uh, article that sky Jatani made actually in 2011 so it's been a long time but he, he basically has the bible become an idol and i wanted to give that 
uh, top topic to us um, in, the, in the article. He, he basically says that uh, the understanding of, of God informs how many Christians engage the Bible. They believe that scriptures are divine instruction manual for life, uh, a resource to be called for principles uh, that may be applied to any challenge. Um, it's, uh, the, uh, the, he said, I've heard that lead, Bible leaders joke that the Bible stands for basic instructions before leaving earth. Um, and he says, um, we may chuckle at these metaphors, but behind them is a very unchristian understanding of God and ironically, and very unbiblical uh, one and rooted in the enlightenment. So I wanted okay, to so toss that out. Like Let me just say this. We have a thrift store as part of the ministry that I run. And people bring us all the things they don't want to throw away. Okay. And we're thankful to have it because we can use some of that. None of my volunteers will throw away a Bible. I don't care if it's been in the flood, if it's been crapped on, if it has mold growing out of it, it could be falling apart. It does not matter. It's not going to go in the dumpster. So I have to hide them to throw them away because they are convinced if they throw that Bible in the garbage, God is going to smite them, whatever that supposedly looks like but it's going to curse them. You know, it's worse than breaking a mirror while walking under a ladder and having a black cat rock, walk in front of you all at the same time. I mean, it is ridiculous. It is ridiculous. And don't get me started on how many times somebody has sent me to hell because I don't read out of the King James Version, so we just won't even go there. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Now, Brooke, this mm. is crazy. <laughs> so, I mean, and it's bigger than that. Like, talking about the idolatry of the bible is bigger than that but that is such a symbol of how they see who god is and what that paper those pieces of paper symbolize and i'll be quiet now the only thing i'm going to say to that too is i think it's important to realize that every idol is made out of something good when god created the world he said it's good so all idols no matter if it's a golden monkey or calf sitting on your shelf or the word the physical thing that contains the words of god that can become an idol so no matter how good something is it can your family your job your whatever that can become an idol now that doesn't mean that you know every time somebody uses it it's an idol obviously but yeah i i think that's important to realize that no matter how good something can be it is something we could elevate above god if it's not god itself I think, I think one of the important things to recognize about the Bible is, first of all, the Bible is a testament to a God who wills to reveal God's self. The, the Bible is a testament to God's self-revelation. And so God appears to Moses and says, I am, and here's how you're going to know who I am, and here's how you're going to relate to me. Here are the Ten Commandments. Here is the entire book of Leviticus. You know, this is how to relate to me. God self-reveals, and the Word of God is the testament of God's self-revelation. God ultimately reveals God's self fully and finally in the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And the New Testament, the Gospels and the writings of the Apostles, are the written testimony to God's self-revelation in Jesus Christ. And so the Bible is always pointing us back to the ultimate reality of God's self-revelation. And the way that we understand God's self-revelation is only and always within the context of the church. There is no such thing as just me and the Bible. Yep. It's always me and the Bible in community. And so tradition has to always be alongside scripture. And reading the scripture in community, in the community of the faithful, is the only way to understand God's self-revelation. So the church, the, 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 right. church <laughs> the church limits itself by the scripture, like the, the church submits herself to the authority of the word of God, but the church also has the responsibility of interpreting the word of God. And it is only always within the church 
that we can that we can encounter the mystery of the triune God who has been fully revealed in the person of Jesus Christ and whom we come to understand in the context of community in the words of sacred scripture read and proclaimed. Let us pray. Father God, we ask you to please help us Americans to properly repent from our original sins. Help us to seek reconciliation and justice for our black brothers and sisters. Help us, Lord, to stop buying into the lie that Americanism tells us that I can succeed alone and I do not need anyone else. We absolutely need each other. We need to help one another, care for one another, and love one another in community. Lord, please guide us in properly using the Bible to spread the gospel and to reveal your self-revelation to the world. And help us to stop using it as a golden calf and as a weapon to tear people down. These things I ask in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thanks for tuning in to our three-point sermon. We do hope that you will watch the complete episode. We have more discussion and a lively top five debate. Also, remember, if you like our content, make sure to give us a like, subscribe to our channels, and maybe tell someone about us by sharing. Thanks, everyone.